From snow-capped mountains to the rugged Pacific shore, the Coast Guard races into action. Let's go! Mark, 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 three o'clock inside. The air crew must rescue the rescuers when a search party gets stuck in the frozen wilderness. Get in the basket! Get in the basket! A frantic call for help sends a law enforcement unit tearing across the Columbia River. You guys ready? Yep. Yeah. And Roger, a helicopter team flies to a surfer battered on the Oregon coast. There's blow the aircraft going down. It was a pretty dangerous place to be at, especially if you're trying to carry somebody with a back injury or a neck injury. I would definitely need to get out of here. High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live in a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Radar's coming to stand by. Doors closed. Report ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. Lieutenant Leo Lake, an H-60 pilot here at Air Station Astoria. Where we're going to go out for a routine boat training flight. 6029. We're going to be averting you. Okay. Yeah, we have two hikers, a male and a female, mid-30s, missing from Saturday. Stand by for position. We're out to that. We got a call on the radio from the command center for two hikers lost on Mount Adams. The elevation is showing about 6,000 feet. Wow. In my mind, I'm thinking that these two are hypothermic, cold, they're running low on supplies, and they need out of there quick. They've been up for three days, they said, stuck in the snow. Yeah. Their supplies are running low. Now things are getting interesting. Yep. Well, I'm throwing out my gators right now. Throwing out another jacket. Recently, we've had a few pretty intense inland search and rescue cases, which most people don't really look at the Coast Guard and think that's something we do. A little bit of rain squall right in front of us, and then after that, it looks like a few clouds. The Pacific Northwest is a mountainous area with a lot of trees, a lot of outdoor things to do. So a lot of hikers will come to Oregon looking for great hikes, scenery, camping. It sounds like uh, they got snowed in. They don't want to stay another night and be hungry. Yeah. Unfortunately, with that, you end up with people in trouble and, and find themselves in sticky situations. Are we direct to, or are you kind of following the river up? We're going to kind of follow the river to Hood River and then skirt up. Roger. As we went up there, we tried a couple different valleys to get up there, but the clouds were impeding our progress. Got a big wall. I'm not sure I want to climb to that. that. Kind of nasty. Clouds were just piled up and got bad pretty quickly. I don't see this getting better. Let's go ahead and uh, turn around. Okay. 45 degrees angle of bank. Roger. There we go. That was a good call. Now what? Can we find a hole and see how high we can go? Yeah, it's right above us, right there. Perfect. We ultimately decided to climb up and then go over the clouds. 7,000 feet. Not on top yet. We'll just keep climbing up. It's gorgeous up here, though. Fantastic up here. That's Adam's, yeah. right? It is indeed. That is so awesome. So when we flew up through the clouds, we saw absolutely how gorgeous it was on top. Yeah, this is just unreal how pretty this is. It's just one of those moments where, you know, we realized we're going to help some people, but had to take a look out the window. It was, it was beautiful. I told you I should have brought my board. I could just ride down to these people. We get caught up in the beauty and what we get to see flying around here. and You have to lock back on real quick, and it just, it's just, it's instinctual, you know? You're not there to, to ooh and ah and, and enjoy what's going on. You're there to get a job done. Service 2 9, operation is normal. Currently orbiting above the position of the two persons, trying to find a way down to them at this time, over. Some really good holes down here. What do you think about going down there? It looks like it'll, it'll break clear down there, too. Let's take advantage of it then. Okay, here we go. Once we were at 10,000 feet, we flew over the exact point where the two hikers were located, and we were able to corkscrew or circle our way down through an open cloud. 40 knots. Roger, thanks. 
It's definitely an intense scenario as a pilot flying in the mountains around clouds. Maintain an easy descent. 30, close up, down below. Trying to close up up here. Roger. A couple years back, a Coast Guard helicopter crashed in the mountains near Salt Lake City. That was basically on the forefront of my mind. 25 knots. Roger, thanks. It took a long time coming in there. Definitely was a little nerve wracking of that approach. We were holding on to our seats a little bit. Start here a little bit. Looking good on the left. Opening up a little bit down here. We were able to find a hole, drop down, start heading towards the position that was passed to us. OK, we are coming up right Correct. to where we're supposed to be. Now our goal is to find these people. All right, course one open. Where are you guys? See if you can't pick up some sort of a trail or anything. My plan is to just kind of fly along the contour of this mountain here. At this point, we're basically just flying around looking for signs of people. The snow has covered just about everything. It made it hard to figure out where we were exactly in relation to the trail. Oh, mark, mark, mark. Oh, inside. Three o'clock inside, right down here. Three o'clock coming at the four. Like people, they have like a sleeping bag. Still in sight. Okay. I saw one person. That should be them. As we're flying over, we see a couple people waving bags over their heads. Okay, I have them in sight. I'm going to come to a high hover right here. I this guy's hiking off. I don't know what trees. I don't know. Well, there's like trees over by one o'clock, and there's a group of people over there. What? A group of people? Yeah, and at one o'clock further into the trees. As we're hovering, we start seeing more people come out of the woods. At first, I'm really confused. I thought, hey, there's supposed to be two hikers. How many people are there? I see three or four, a total of five. OK, five of them. Yep, five. It was kind of unusual because we saw five people. So that can't be the the two hikers. At this point, sir, I should just go down there, talk to them, figure it out, and so we could just get the hell out of here. OK, sounds good. Figure out what's going on. OK. Quickly had to kind of reassess what we were doing here. So we decided to send myself down. Everyone's ready? In the hike. Low checks, please. Door's going down. Door's going down. We're definitely below the tree line, so we're making sure that the aircraft doesn't con left or right. This is enough to is good. Going down. We had a small tree next to Chris, and I'm trying to keep the aircraft relative to that. Going down. Door's away. Retrieve the cable. You're clear up. So we lower the rescue swimmer down, and what he's dealing with is a couple feet of snow, and he has to hike quite a distance to find out what's going on. Oh, two nine swimmer. Swimmer, go ahead. Uh, this is a search party. This is not the two subjects that are lost. Come to find out, it was actually a search party looking for the missing hikers. I do have the guy down here on the bus and leg. Nothing needs to get out of here. From there, we found out that one of them was injured, his leg, it hurt, so he couldn't continue to walk. Do you guys want to maybe get him out of here and then continue on looking for the other two people? Yeah, I mean, we're here, but we might as well pull him out for right now. OK, Roger. I need other folks to be advised. A couple of them are requesting to get out of here. So the search party doesn't look very prepared. They're cold, they're scared, they see this big orange helicopter fly up, and they want to get in it and go home. They want to be hoisted. They want out. Sir, it's getting dark to do. At that moment, I'm thinking space and time, and we still have to go find these other two hikers. And what is the probability of us finding the other two, just out of curiosity? I, I don't know. I'm a little concerned about the setting sun. Roger. I don't know. What do you guys think we should do at this time, Lord? I don't know. We were sent up here to find two, and I think that uh, they have to assume some sort of a risk. I don't know. Sir, it's getting dark, too. We assume that the rescue team were prepared enough to stay the night and survive conditions like that. Roger, understand. How about we take the one with the broken leg, we search, and if we have the space and the power and we can come back for all of them, I'm, I'm game to do that. Yeah, Let's... Roger, I agree. I'll tell them we're taking the one, and we'll try to come back for the next four. Let you guys know when I'm ready to get out of here. Over. When you're on the rescue side of a case like this, you have to be prepared to take care of yourself. I'm wondering if they have a bag to help them stay overnight, because chances are they're probably going to be stuck out there. Top radio is next to the basket. OK. We're taking the basket with the radio. Roger. We determined that we would give them a radio to contact us if need be. That's going down. This is not too good. We're sending the trail in. It's a pretty straightforward hoist. Bring the basket down, have him get in it real slow, real comfortable. And survivor is getting into the basket. Easy back, hold. Yeah. Take the load. 
Take the load. I'm bringing the injured rescue party survivor up into the cabin. I knew that he was injured, but I didn't know to what extent. Bring back inside. Ask you is inside cabin. Roger. I asked him if he was OK. He screamed back, yes, glad to be aboard. He seemed to be pretty happy, though, that he was getting out of there. And Chris, tell us when you're ready to go. Roger that. Bring it above. And then just a quick pickup of myself, bear hook, got out of there as quick as we could to continue our search. Bring it inside cabin. Roger. Some doors closed, ready for forward flight. Roger. So we're racing the sun now, guys. Yeah. Because this gets a lot more complicated at nighttime. So this guy says he knows right where those other people are at. He told me that he had a GPS position of where the survivors were at. Pulled out the GPS. So we're, the blue diamond is where we are right now. We're just about to get on top of them. We're just about Look, to get on we're, top we're of them. We're 400 feet away. We're getting past them. Mark, mark, mark. Roger, perfect. Diamond knows money, dude. OK, it's 1 o'clock, just below the searchlight. They have a headlamp. Are you guys going to just roll into this? Yes, sir. At this point, our thought was we could just put down the basket. They could hop in, pick them up, and we're good to go. And uh, ready up. OK, this will be a basket without trail line. Roger, but it looks like they are uh, stocked in. These guys are huddled in, and they're not moving. Yeah, they're not. They're not moving, guys. Well, maybe when you set the basket down, they will. Roger yeah. that. That's going down. They weren't getting picture. I think the, the wind was too high, and they were uh, barricading themselves down with their tarp and tent. All right, that's the wind inside. Uh, I hope they're all right. I don't really know what the deal was, but quickly we realized that I was going to have to go down and, and help them. Door's going out the door. Door's going down. Dan hoisted me down to a fairly open spot. I run up to him, talk to him, figure out what's going on. And he is clear. Give me the hook. Looks like they're getting out of that. Yes. Looks like rescue cameras approaching them. Yep. As soon as they saw me walking up to their tent, they popped right out. They definitely needed help. They were soaked through on their clothes, and they just wanted to go home. Survivor is getting in the basket. I ready to pick up, take the load. This hoist was a lot different, a lot more confined space. It was a little higher. I think it was about 120 feet. Bring your driver inside cabin. And get your driver outside of the basket. And that's going out the door. Roger. One by one, they just came up, and they looked real happy to be in the cabin. And bring your driver inside cabin. Both of them look extremely cold and wet, so we got them into the troop seat and got some blankets around them. Retrieve the store. Or is inside cabin, hoist sleep. Roger, hoist sleep. They picked me up and then moved right back over to the rescue team because we had time. Yeah, they are right up the nose. Any flashes on the flashlight, it looks like they might be ready. So we're here, we might as well pull them now. The conditions weren't getting any better. Yeah, basket going up the door. I'm trying to bring all the gear. Go on, Stuart, what do you want us to do here? Get in the basket. Come on, get in the basket. He's crawling around the ground. Drop your gear. They had these giant hiking backpacks on. We put down a whole lot of rotor wash, and they would just blow over. What is he doing? He's wrapping the basket up underneath himself. Oh my god. These guys are literally crawling to the basket, trying to bring all their bags up with them. Can you get rid of that gear? Leave the backpack. Where are you? They finally get one in the basket, and he has like a leg hanging out and an arm hanging out. I'm getting this guy retrieving the basket, clear the deck. Okay. So we have one guy? We got one guy coming okay. up halfway up. He got the hint. He took the backpack off and got in the basket. OK, you're good. Bring him in. After that, it was extremely smooth. It was just one after another. All right, here we go. And he's getting outside the basket, nice the cabin. Packing them like sardines in here. We were just going to pile in. There's a record of 26 people in the, in the back of that cabin, so I knew they would fit. And he's getting outside the basket, nice the cabin. Roger. And one more going down. I can only imagine what the rescue team is going through. They weren't really set up to spend the night. One of them gets injured. They're all cold. They're tired. And inside the cabin, he's getting outside. Okay, let's get the hell out of here. What do you think? Roger. And the cabin door is closed. Once the last person got into the cabin and uh, I saw their happy faces, we're getting ready for forward flight. I just couldn't help myself but feel a little bit of pride. Is your leg okay, Clint? Or you don't want to take an ambulance ride and we'll get there? All right. Okay, we are now above the clouds, and now we get to figure out how to go home. So we're going to take everyone to Portland. It was the closest airport, and they have jet fuel, which is what we need. This can eat. Awesome flight. It was great. Thank you. When we landed at Portland, I was glad to have seven people safely on deck. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're safe. Thank you. It felt great being able to help out seven people who very possibly would not have made it had we not shown up. My group probably got within 0.5 miles of them, but the snow was like up past our uh, waists. My name is Ian Thompson. I'm a part of Thurston County Search and Rescue.
Once we started the climb, it started snowing harder and harder. It was such deep snow, and we were already so tired and cold. And survivor is getting into the basket. He's back and cold. It's a little embarrassing, because we are search and rescue after all. And he's getting outside the basket, eyes in the cabin. But I'm just so grateful that the Coast Guard could come and pick us up and make sure we all got home safe. Scamania County, we have recovered all five of your rescue teams. These people went out in unknown conditions, and so to make sure that they have a warm bed to sleep in, they get to go home to their parents and their loved ones, it's a good feeling. OK, now we get to go home. This is actually my third year doing the Hood to Coast, and I think every year our team gets better. Let's go! We got a report of a crew member on board is in fear for his life. It was kind of eerie not knowing what you're getting yourself into, hoping there's not someone there with a gun. Lieutenant Leo Lake, this weekend we have a Coast Guard team running the Hood to Coast Relay. It's a 197 mile relay from the top of Mount Hood all the way down to Seaside, Oregon at the coast. Yeah. This is about a 29 hour relay. You run down along Willamette River into downtown Portland, turn off Highway 30, you start crossing the coast range. It's very hilly and mountainous. It's fun to see the towns from the ground that we normally are looking down on from the Hilo. Each person has three legs apiece. When I get to my finish point, I hand it off to my wife, Sarah, and she'll take off and run her leg, and so on and so forth. There are some teams that are really competitive, and they really go out there, and they're trying to run five, six-minute miles. We're just trying to go out and have a good time and enjoy hanging out with each other and pushing ourselves physically. My name is Lieutenant Sarah Pulliam. I work for the Enforcement Division here at Sector Columbia River. I'm running leg three, and it's pretty much all downhill. It's coming off of Mount Hood through some kind of awesome redwood-looking forest, kind of foggy and nice and cool. There was this lady running in front of me, and she looked like Xena the Warrior Princess from the back. My goal the entire leg was to catch up with her, which didn't work out so well. Come on, Sarah! It's exciting to see what people are going to do and what people are going to bring to the race, especially with its proximity to Portland. Portland's kind of weird. I'm AMT3 Rashad Gibson, currently stationed at uh, Air Station Astoria. This is actually my third year doing the Hood to Coast. Uh, I've enjoyed it every year, and I think every year our, our team gets better. I'm running leg 10. It's not that bad. It's pretty flat, but the next one is going to be seven miles, two miles uphill, and then the rest is downhill, so that's going to be pretty grueling for the legs. We got a report of a 100-plus foot fishing vessel, crew member on board, stating that the crew has been fishing illegally and is in fear for his life. He says he's locked himself in the stateroom. He got conflicting information from the skipper on board, saying that the crew member's on drugs and that they locked him inside the stateroom. So we're going to put you three over to ride the boat the rest of the way in, wherever it's at. And we got any questions? No. Here up at the Cape, we do a lot of search and rescue, and uh, occasionally some law enforcement but something like this is not normal around here. So we had a three-person boarding team, uh, arm up. Force clear! Right. If someone's saying their life is in danger, then we're going to be out there responding. Coming up. All right. So we'll assess where the best part to put you guys over is, and we'll get over get the boat into the dock safe. All right. BM2, Patrick O'Brien, Station Cape Disappointment. The boat was coming across the uh, Columbia River bar making its way upriver to Astoria. Did they say what kind of drugs? No, he did not. The nice thing right now is that he's isolated. Because if he's crazy like that, if he's locked in the same room already, leave him there. Well, there's a ton of flex cuffs in there, too, so if we need to use them. So we had a lot of scenarios that were kind of playing through our head. Are you dealing with a hostile crew, or are you just dealing with one hostile crew member? As soon as you get on board, make sure you ask the weapons question. It's not 
safe to get it to take care of it underway, wait until you get to the dock. <laughs> Training time was about 25 minutes, and with the, the wind the way it was, it's probably about 15 to 20 knots, and it was uh, blowing right up the river. So it's causing all those waves to stack right on top of the 25. It's a pretty bumpy ride on the way out there. Just hoping we could catch up with them before they make port. 556, the vessel is over 100 feet long, and the vessel's name is Ocean Cape. Oh, I said that came to us guy on channel 1 and 6. Is your question on you? Uh, 10 POV. Do you need assistance and we'll get you assistance? Yeah. Fishing vessel had 10 persons on board. Having three in our boarding party and 10 on the crew it created an unsafe condition on board the boat. Is this her? Yep, Ocean Cape. Yeah, that's a big boat. Yep, Ocean Cave. Yeah, that's a big boat. If it doesn't look like there's going to be a safe spot, we'll get him to lower a Jacob's ladder on one of the sides. Yeah, oh, yeah, some, some, some sort of ladder. So when we came along scene, we weren't able just to come alongside like we would normally do to a vessel and just climb right over onto their deck. Ocean Cave, this is Coast Guard. Captain, we're going to come on board, verify everything's safe. We have a door on your port side. Is that accessible? Over. Yeah, not a problem. Noticed the door that they had a little bit higher than the water line. Uh, we got a hold of the captain crew, said, hey, can we go through that door? He said it was fine. So then it was just more of a matter of trying to get on board safely. You guys ready? Yep. Yeah. It was kind of eerie not knowing what you're getting yourself into. You're just jumping inside of a boat, hoping for the best, hoping there's not someone there with a gun. Captain, go ahead and keep turning the port. Time that swell. Time that, yeah. We're getting deployed off our bow. And with the two to four foot of ebb chop, it was a very sloppy uh, transfer. We really had to time our, our leap over into this door. Just let me know when you're making your approach. Making an approach. All right. We're going alongside a vessel that's that stable, and we're on a smaller vessel that's just bobbing up and down on the waves. It's all about timing. Your bow's right there. You better step over now, or otherwise you're going to fall in between two boats. You could easily get crushed. Run over. Time in the waves and jumping from one boat to another. It can be pretty sketchy at times. As the boat was going down, Petty Officer Zimmer he stepped over, and his back foot up that was on the 25 lost any footing. He was able to get in safely, but it was a lot more nerve wracking than it needed to be. Right on. The door opens up, they go inside, and now we lose sight of them. And who knows what's on the other side of it when they came inside. Cave disappointment, 556 five, three-man boarding team, embarked fishing vessel, ocean, cave, over. We don't know the, the willingness of the, the captain and the crew on board, so a lot of uneasiness. Just trying to keep eyes on the boat. If there's anything that looks bad up on deck, then we'll radio back to station and get local authorities to meet the boat at the dock. They got to get on board and assess the situation to see what's safe. And if they would have had an emergency on board, they would have definitely radioed us and said, hey, we need to get back up and get off of this boat. Right now, we're just confirming the reports of uh, all the parties. Go to port side two, where we get this guy off the boat and uh, continue. Boarding team 5-6, Roger. Getting the call from the boarding party that they didn't encounter any problems during the boarding, and then seeing the boat more up safely was definitely a good feeling. Do you want them still on the boat? Or? No, once they're moored up, we can take them off. Once it's off the pier, I'll them off. OK. The two parties are now both calm. Uh, the individual just wanted to get off the boat. It's his first time ever being on a boat. Most fishing trips on these big boats are anywhere from one week to a month. Uh, it got to day three, and he wanted to go back in. I said, whatever, dude. I said, I'm not trying to cause problems for you guys. I just want to go home. And I don't want to be on a fishing boat that's doing illegal it's kind of, kind of difficult from our point of view to find out you know, what's going on. Captain's claiming he caught this guy smoking marijuana. Um, but from the crew member's standpoint, he was saying that he was fearing for his life because their uh, fishing boat's doing illegal fishing and also dumping like plastic and oil over in the ocean. We need them to do a freaking commercial boarding on this yeah. thing. If it's everything he's saying is. Yeah, seriously. Conflicting reports, you got to figure out what exactly is going on. Yeah, it's about. 
The VBST is coming out to assist us with this boarding. It's a very large boat, so having the extra people from the VBST also helps make this a quicker boarding. Okay, how long is on this boat? On this boat? Six weeks to two months. Okay. Helps ensure that the safety of this vessel is good so something like this doesn't happen again. Did find a few violations uh, at the completion. You know, it's just part of the job, making sure this is 100% uh, safe for these guys to be out there. A lot of times, the captain sees this as like a nuisance. But for the most part, this captain was very cooperative. They understand that and we were just there to make sure everybody stayed safe. And it was crucial to maintain a good relationship with the commercial fishing fleet, knowing that if uh, they, you know, they are in trouble, we're going to be the ones going out there to help them. My name is Sean Morrison. I'm a deckhand on the fishing vessel Pacific Cape. The Coast Guard, uh, in my opinion, risk their lives every day to come out and, and help us. It is absolutely dangerous out here on the water. I mean, it's just life and death on these things. You know? I, I thank the Coast Guard, and I appreciate them. They're just amazing folks. Lieutenant Leo Lake, one of the pilots here at Air Station Astoria. It's in the middle of the night. We're in downtown Portland, and I'm running my second leg of the Hood to Coast Relay. All right, we just need to get on Highway 30. It should be easy. I would definitely say logistics are the hardest part. You've got to make sure that you're at each individual's exchange point the right way. You're fighting traffic. Everybody's tired, hungry, emotional, cramped in the car together. Well, we just got uh, towed because we were apparently illegally parked. The Abandoned lot that we thought we parked in turned out to be a parking lot that was opening in like 30 minutes. But we saved it. Would have been a total loss if it had been impounded. I'm AMT3 Rashad Gibson, uh, currently stationed at uh, Air Station Astoria. We're outside of Honey Bucket. I'm going to go on my run. It's the last leg of this thing. And then uh, I think there's two more after me, and then we're finished. We'll be running on the beach after that. Way to go. Way to go. Look Engine We're approaching the 29 hour mark right now. We started at 11.15 at Mount Hood yesterday, and now we're down at the beach in Seaside. Right now, this is not a typical Oregon beach. It's like we're in Southern California or something. There's people everywhere. We're looking forward to crossing the finish line all together as Team Coast Guard. You know, we were part of a team that ran 198 miles. We ran from Mount Hood to Seaside, Oregon. And to be able to say that you've participated in an event like that, it's a lot of fun. It's pretty rewarding. And uh, I think it's something that we're going to try to organize again next year. Thanks for doing it. It was a lot of fun. We're in the hood to coast. 200 miles of uh, pure hell. received a call from uh, Skamania County, a reporting source that had called in and said that as he was up on the Table Mountain hike, he heard somebody calling for help that had fallen and gotten hurt. Lieutenant Commander Nathan Coulter, a uh, individual was up hiking with his dog and thought that he heard another person yelling for help. So they're assembling a team. They should be up in the area probably 40 minutes from now. The sheriff was mounting a hasty team with search volunteers to go up on the path. Okay, that's about it. All right. All right. We would transit out there and conduct a search using our infrared camera as well as night vision goggles. Flight control still normal. Group ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. Section 35, we are airborne at this time. We've got about three and a half hours of fuel on board. AC3 Chris Austin, since it's an inland case, it's definitely a little bit different than our, our typical stuff. Guy goes on a hike with his dog. On his way up the mountain, he hears someone calling for help. Yes. Table Mount is kind of a flat top, but you know all this stuff is treacherous. This particular search area was characterized by various terrain features. The most treacherous is the first place that we'll typically look. So anything with cliffs. This must be it up here. It's probably an 80 foot pier cliff right there. You know. This guy might be down some cliff somewhere. We do know the time is of essence in a situation like this. This guy's bleeding out, he's gonna be in trouble. That's a pretty gnarly drop. It's probably 
That's a pretty gnarly drop. This guy might be down some cliff somewhere. We do know the time is of essence in a situation like this. We'll go up to the top there and just start just kind of working that ridge line. The ground party wasn't on scene yet, so we conducted our aerial search. You can run the searchlight if you want to sweep. Uh, he's out here, we'll find him. I'm using the FLIR heat signature camera. It's pretty good. It'll find just about anything that's out there. You're looking for any sort of abnormalities, maybe some broken branches, you know, clothing, something that just doesn't look right. There is some footsteps going up there. Yeah, there was definitely something in there. During the search, I identified a small light source. We hovered very close to it, trying to identify what it was. Marking on a tree, maybe. Yeah, like a blaze for a trail. Yeah. I think you're right. I think that's what it is. We spent a couple hours searching around the top of the mountain, working our way down. Skamini County uh, Coast Guard, our team estimates approximately two hours before they're on top of the mountain. Roger that. We talked to the Skamania Star Controller. Their ground party was currently climbing up the mountain. See if we can drop them off. Why don't you give them a call, see if they want to express ride up to the top. We were able to offer up to the ground party kind of an elevator ride up the mountain. Safety to load. Basket's coming up. To you know, more quickly reach the search area. Once we got them on board, it was about a minute and a half, and they were 3,500 feet up. Roger, clear them out. That's good work. That's definitely going to expedite things. Sir, you're clear, sir. Ground team, guys, calling us. Uh, we are good to go from here. Hey, okay, Roger that. Ninja, what we'll do is we'll give you a few minutes to listen up, and then we'll head over to International and gas up. Copy that. Sounds like a good plan. All right. Straight up and then slide left. So we told them we were going to depart, go to Portland to refuel and give them a couple hours to search. Make sure for 3 5, we're landing at EDX. We're going to grab some gas, reevaluate, and go from there. Group for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. And we took off the next time we were taking off, just prior to the sun coming up, and we were able to transition into a daylight search. Second and three five, currently searching the area of the missing person. We established radio contact with the ground crew. They provided a couple of additional search areas that they wanted us to look at. So we spent another hour and a half to two hours looking in those spots and then circling the mountain again. I don't see like, any evidence of uh, really anything, you know, coming down the hill. Yeah. be laying underneath one of these trees, we're just not going to see them. Honestly, on any star case, I ask myself if this is my wife, son, daughter, brother, how would I want someone to go about doing it? If there's a chance that there's someone there, I want to be able to say I gave it my best effort. You can only orbit the same mountain so many times, and I think it got to the point where we just realized that we're not really going to find anything right now, and hopefully this guy either found his way out or uh, he's not there. The search party had uh, looked all over the summit and where they wanted to focus their search on. They uh, radioed it in to us that they uh, were ready for a pickup and picked them up and uh, delivered them back down to their, their base. I felt comfortable that we had searched as best we could. It's kind of a mystery because we did send out another helicopter the next day to search, and they didn't come up with anything either. It happens quite frequently throughout a year where we do searches for days on end, and we don't really find anything until like a snow thaws or something, and then they're, they're found quite a while later. Put after Chris Austin, and the alarm went off for a surfer in distress down in Cannon Beach. Ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. And away we go. At this air station, it, it is pretty common to have gentlemen who get in trouble from surfing, but I don't know if he's somewhere stuck up on a rock 
if he is being sucked out to sea, if, if it's a medevac. All we know is that there's one patient at this time. We have to get down there. We have to try and rescue him, assist him however we can. The surfing area called The Cove is on Seaside Beach. It's about 15 miles south of the air station. And when those waves come together right there is where the waves build up, and that's where the surfers like to go. So fire department's on 22 Alpha. Nicole, I give them a call. Roger that. Lieutenant Rob McCabe, H-60 pilot, Air Station Astoria. Local fire and rescue are already on scene with the surfer. We establish communications with them on the radio. They immediately tell us that they want to hoist this gentleman out and get him to a higher level of care. I got a flashing light right there. Roger, safe. Yeah, looking at it, you can't tell me that that group of guys could not have just walk him out of here. About a 15, probably 20 minute hike from here. Yeah. From what it looked like as we flew down, we were wondering why they needed our assistance at all. You know, they could, they already had him littered up. He could have just been walked up the beach with all the guys that were there. My only concern is if these guys are trying to carry this dude out, if they slip on one of these rocks and drop him, they can really screw him up. Should we put you down and have you take a look at him? That's what I was going to say. Do you want to go down and you can radio up and see what you think? OK. And so then if worst comes to worst, you can help him hike him out and we'll yeah. just stay here. OK. How does that sound? That sounds great. So looking down at the survivor, it looks like a pretty flat area. But what we see from up top and, and what I see when I get down there are two different things. So I'll have to make the judgment call when I get down there for what happens next. So let's take a bleep. First going down. First blow, the aircraft going down. As I was getting hoisted down, that's when I really understood. It's soaking wet on those rocks. It was super steep. It was a pretty dangerous place to be at, especially if you're trying to carry somebody with a possible back injury. And so on deck. What was that? So I called up to the helicopter and told them, we need to hoist this guy out of there. And so on deck. What was that? It's soaking wet on those rocks. It was super steep. It was a pretty dangerous place to be at. So I called up to the helicopter and told them that we, we need to hoist this guy out of there. So we're going to litter the guy out. Uh, we would want to get a little closer so we're not as much in the rocks. Yeah, if we're going to litter him out, I'll move up forward there a little bit, but almost right where they're at now. Yeah, that's, that's a good spot. As I walked up to the survivor in the litter, I saw that there was just a gaggle of people. You had local guys that maybe found them, some people that were just onlookers that happened to be standing right there. So quickly, I, you know, I asked him politely, you know, can you guys just step back for a little bit? We, we need to help this guy out. We'll plan on hoisting him from right where he is now. No need to move him. I found out quickly from the other paramedics and all the, the gentlemen that were helping him out that he had a potential uh, spinal injury, and uh, he was starting to get pretty hypothermic. It's just shaking like crazy. All that matters is that patient and getting them out of there. Swimmer 6013. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're almost set up here. The plan will be uh, taking the patient to Seaside Airport, where Life Flight will be waiting in uh, 20 minutes. I'm going to start sliding right, see if I can see how close I'm going to be able to snug myself into these trees. Roger. Right 10. Ma'am T2, Alex Ward. A surfer being injured is not terribly uncommon, uh, but to have him be injured to the point that he has to be litter hoisted is fairly rare. Rudder right clearance is good, sir. I'm going to hold right here. All I can really see is the beach and the cliff that we're hoisted next to. So I've got to rely on my flight mechanic. He's my primary sight and my primary eyes to the side, underneath, and behind me, because those are the areas I can't see. All right, looks like I got ready for pickup. Roger, port and right 15. And hold, preparing to take the load. Taking the load. Just swinging just a hair, trying to get under control. So in this case, when we're hoisting the survivor, when it comes to a back injury, any movement in the cable or any jerking on the litter can be detrimental to his condition. So when we picked him up off the beach, I'm really focusing on making sure I maintain the most stable hover I possibly can. And trying to take the extended. I'm driver to coming up. Left, just a hair. Roger, easy left. We caught the litter from, from swinging too much, and then you just hold on to that trail line as best you can and just make sure that he gets up there quickly and safely. And litter's at the cabin door. Bring litter to the cabin. Roger. After we get the uh, survivor in the cabin, the next step is to recover the swimmer. Swimmer's in the cabin. 
I looked down at the patient, he was hurting. We started flying over to Seaside Airport, which is only a couple minutes from where we were at. We're gonna pass him off to Life Flight. We have the ability to fly the survivor all the way to Portland, but for the in-flight care, if we wanna get an IV started, be able to pass drugs and have a little bit better treatment for him, then it's better to pass him off to Life Flight. Coast Guard 6013, runway 34, full stop. We're landed at Seaside Airport. The Life Flight crew and our crew get together and uh, used a backboard to transport the survivor from our helicopter into their helicopter. At least in there with a couple of EMPs on the way over. Having Life Flight come right in right behind us is a good feeling, and it's nice to know that somebody else has my back and has that survivor's back. Yeah, sector from the 6013, be advised, patient transferred. We're getting ready to head back home. ETA about five minutes. 13, sector, roger. This is a very typical Pacific Northwest case because it involves some terrain. You know, around here, everything's a little bit rugged. Good work, guys. Yeah, good job, Chris. Yeah, you too, man. I've been on a lot of medevac cases since I've been here. Each one of them is a little bit different, but it all seems to come from the fact that it is Oregon. It's beautiful, but it's, it's not a super safe place all the time. You know, you slip and you fall down the wrong cliff, or you slip on your surfboard and you get drug up a beach. So you have to be prepared for that whenever you come in for duty. My name's Andre Lawrence. Grew up in Oregon and surfing here since I was about 13. The place I surf, it's a big headland and, and super rocky, big boulders. It's kind of notoriously dangerous wave. The only real thing I remember is the wave itself crashing and then waking up on the rocks. I was in excruciating pain and super hypothermic, shivering uncontrollably. And then the next thing I notice, I hear the helicopter. Preparing to take the load. Taking the load. Found out later was a collapsed lung and broken ribs. So I'm very thankful for the Coast Guard and what they did. Um, they got me out of there safe. Bring the cabin. My doctors say 100% recovery, and that's what I'm expecting. And I'm hoping by springtime I'm back in the water. The Coast Guard has a really strong presence on our coast. When we're surfing and we see the Coast Guard choppers almost every time we're out, they're checking the waves right along with us. It's kind of a unique relationship. We have a lot in common. I'm very thankful to have them around being a, being a surfer and living on the ocean. Mm -hmm.